Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming here. I, I, I really appreciate it, and, uh, and I really appreciate being here. I have uh, tend to make these flying visits to Los Angeles, and I've never gotten a chance to go to the museum. Today's my first day at the museum, so I, after I get done talking to you guys and signing some books, I hope, if you want them signed, uh, I mean, you know, if they probably are a little more valuable if they aren't signed, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, uh, spend some time, and then I've got a I've got a five-year-old that, like, if it's got wheels, it rules, you know. And so I've got to go down and do some. I've been on out on book tour for three weeks, and so I can't come home empty-handed. So I got to do some shopping here today, too. Um, anyway, it is, I'm afraid, a last time to say, how shall we put it, sayonara to the American car, um, American automobile companies. Ford, GM, even Chrysler, they're going to live on in some form, a kind of Marley's ghost dragging their chains at taxpayers' expense. You know, I mean, you know, the fools in the corner offices of Detroit and the fool officials of Detroit unions, they're going to retire to their vacation homes in Palm Beach and St. Petersburg, respectively. I mean, they don't deserve our sympathy. They don't deserve our sympathy any more than the malevolent trolls under the Capitol Dome in Washington do. But Pity the poor American car when Congress and the White House get through with it. I mean, a lightweight vehicle with a small carbon footprint using alternative energy and renewable resources to operate in a sustainable way. When I was a kid, we called it a Schwinn. <laughs> well, you know, I guess it, it's, been, it's been a great 110 years. It's been a great run. It has been a great run. 110 years since the Duryea brothers built the first American uh, automobile in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. You know, and if the Duryea Motor Wagon Company, if it had been a success, Springfield, Massachusetts might be today's motor city full of abandoned houses, unemployment, drug dealing, violent crime, and <laughs> racial tensions. Uh, which, as it so happens, Springfield, Massachusetts is full of anyway. Um, but. But we owe the American car, we owe it a lot more than the uh, entertaining spectacle of Detroit's various felon mayors. Uh, in, in fact, many people my age, oh, we owe our very existence to the car, or to the car's back seat, <laughs> where if you check our parents' wedding anniversary with our birth date and find them like, a little too close to comfort, that is probably where we were conceived. You know, there was no premarital sex. Uh, in America before the invention of the internal combustion engine. It's true. Because you couldn't sneak a girl into the rec room of your farmhouse because your mom and dad, they, they didn't have a car, so they couldn't commute, so they were stuck home all day working on the farm, you know? And your farmhouse didn't have a rec room because recreation had not been discovered due to all the farm work, you know? Yeah, odd Saturday night, you could take a girl out in a buggy, but it was hard to get her into the mood to let you bust into her corset because you know, two of you were facing the hind end of a horse, you know, and it just spoils the atmosphere, you know. So, so the car, the car let us out of the barn, and, and while the car was at it, the car destroyed the American nuclear family, and anyone who has had an American nuclear family can tell you that that was a relief to all concerned. Um, I, and cars cost America to be paved. Uh, there are much worse things you can do to a country than pave it, as the Sudanese have been proven over in Darfur, you know. And, and one of the things I've always wondered is why, 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 we never hear a thank you, never hear a word of thanks, us car people, for getting all of America paved from those kids in the, in the body casts who skateboard all the time. Not, not, not a word of thanks. Um, you know, Cars provided America with an enviable standard of living. Uh, you could not get a steady job with high wages and health and retirement benefits working on the, the general livestock corporation assembly line putting udders on cows. It just couldn't be done, you know? And, and I think that, 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 that the American car was a source of, of, of intellectual stimulation, intellectual stimulation. Because if you think of the innovation, the, 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 the invention, the sheer genius, that transformed the 1908 Model T Ford into the 1968 Shelby Cobra GT500 in the course of one single human lifetime full of speeding tickets. You know? I mean, <laughs> compare this to the progress in the previous mode of transportation. 
horse production, horse design, unchanged for thousands of years, you know. And, you know, when it comes to creativity with the horse, I actually did a little research on this when I was writing about this stuff. I looked it up. You know, nobody thought to put a stirrup, nobody thought to hang a stirrup from a saddle until about 500 A.D. The stirrup was invented in 500. People have been riding horses for thousands of years, and it took them till 500 A.D. to invent this. Where were they putting their feet? I mean, what was, you, know, you know, if automobile design and engineering had proceeded at the same pace as, as, as horse design and engineering, we, we would be powering ourselves down the road by running with both of our feet stuck through a hole in the floor like Fred Flintstone, you know, huh? although it may come to that with the 2010 Obama mobile. You know? <laughs> but most important of all, most important of all, was that cars fulfilled the ideal of America's founding fathers. If all, of all the truths that we hold to be self-evident, of all of the unalienable rights with which we are endowed, which one is most important to the American dream? It is right there, front and center, flat in the name of the Declaration of Independence. Freedom to leave, freedom to get out of town, freedom to get the hell out of here, you know? King George, can I have the keys? You know, that's what the Declaration of Independence says, you know? Now, I gotta tell you, the saga of the American car, it's, this is not an abstract matter to me. This is, this is no subject of fanciful theories. Now, Nancy Pelosi, she may think she was transported home from the maternity ward on pink, fluffy clouds supported by seraphim, you know, low-carbon low, 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 low seraphim. As I <laughs> but I know it was the car that got me to where I am. Uh, my, my grandfather, uh, Jacob O'Rourke, uh, he was born in 1877. He was born on a farm about the size of this podium here, you know in Lime City, Ohio, which was not a city, and didn't even have any lime. I don't know. <laughs> he was one of 10 kids. Grandpa was one of 10 kids. They grew up in a one-room, unpainted shack. I have a photograph of them lined up by age, you know, staring at the photographer, amazed to see someone in shoes. You know, I mean, my great-grandfather, my great-grandfather Barney, he was a woodcutter in the Midwest where there are no trees. Unemployed quite a lot, also drunk, also illiterate. Uh, I, I've got a copy of Barney's marriage certificate with Barney's ex right there, you know. Barney's only accomplishment, aside from the 10 prizes that he won on the uh, corn shuck stuffing of the poor man's roulette wheel there, uh, the only thing that Barney ever accomplished in his life was he, he, he trained a pair of old nags to haul him home, dead drunk. He would fall out of the tavern, pass out in the wagon, and the horses would bring him home. That was what he accomplished in his life. Grandpa Jake, he, uh, he left home armed with a fifth grade education, heading for the bright lights of Toledo, Ohio. And, and he went to work as a buggy mechanic, a buggy mechanic. And then one day, a horseless buggy pulled up at the shop. And Grandpa saw that, and he saw the future, you know. And he fixed that, too. And it didn't take Grandpa long to realize that cleaner hands were to be had and more money was to be made selling the things instead of repairing them. Yeah. And, 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 and also my Uncle Arch's birth date and Grandma and Grandpa's wedding anniversary were a little too close for comfort. And so anyway, he got into car business. He got into car business. And, and, and by the time that I came along in the 1940s, uh, we, we had O'Rourke Buick, and Grandpa and, and, and my Uncle Arch owned the dealership, and my father was the sales manager, and Dad's younger brother, Joe, ran the used car lot, and baby brother Jack was a salesman, and Cousin Ide ran the parts department, and all the aunts and the girl cousins worked in the office, and all the boy cousins and, and, and me, we all worked out on the car lot, you know, cleaning and waxing the cars. and. Arch's son-in-law, my cousin Hep, would go on to run the Ohio Car Dealer Association, and I would go on to do, you know, whatever it is that, that I do uh, in, in, in this book, and write about cars and stuff. Uh, 
I tell you though, there's still, even in these dark days for the American automobile, there are times I wished I'd stayed in Toledo and taken over that Buick agency because really just to be on those late night TV local car dealership ads, <laughs> I got this whole idea. I want to do, uh, I want to do Pirate Pat's Treasure Island Buick and I <laughs> come out with a parrot on my shoulder and one of those big hats and an eye patch, Arr, mateys, you know, okay. on down to Pirate Pat's Treasure Island Buick where prices walk the plank. <laughs> Don't miss our pieces of V8 used car lot, you know, free, free chocolate doubloons for the kitties. <laughs> it's been a great life.